watching Keeping It Green. I'm your host, Debbie Klogers, and today I have with me Mr. Jeff Frank, who is the founder and director of the Nature Lyceum, located in beautiful Riverhead, New York. Welcome, Jeff. Yatahe. Yatahe. Yeah. Let's talk about Yatahe. <laughs> uh, Yatahe is uh, Navajo, or they don't like to be called Navajos. Actually, their name is Denim. Mm -hmm. And um, they have no words for hello or goodbye, so they say Yatahe, and it means walk in beauty. So That's when a Navajo it. greets another Navajo or, um, or they say goodbye, that's how they do it. Very nice. And you've been a uh, Yatahayan people for <laughs> many years. <laughs> many, many years. <laughs> so why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, the Nature Lyceum? Very interesting uh, organization, by the way. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, used to run a botanical garden in Arizona. I was a director of a botanical garden. And while I was there, um, I did everything chemically. Okay, for years, I, I was in the pilot program in New York State back in the early 70s to become certified with chemicals. Well, that was the Green Revolution back then was chemicals. Oh, yeah. That was the way to Ex exactly. en enhance our yield back then. And that's what we did. We didn't know any other mm -hmm. way of doing things. So back in the 60s, I used to spray DDT and chlordane wow. and I'm one of the few people still alive that did say, that. <laughs> you're lucky you're still here. Who knew? <laughs> right. So um, when I, in uh, 83, I was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona at this uh, botanical garden, and I started using an organic product there, and the difference uh, from using it was night and day. We used to grow a half a million flowers for in-house use, and it was an amazing place. Uh, and every time we used organics, we saw differences that we never saw with chemicals. Wow. And uh, you were able to put it together. You were able to put the organic application together with well, it. Well, it was trial and error. We didn't mm -hmm. know what we were doing. Okay. You know, uh, no one could tell you because there was nobody in the United States that knew about organics at that time, back in 1983. Uh, and uh, so I started using it. And, and then I went around trying to find people who could tell me what was going on. And I only found one person, uh, Dr. Ellsworth from the University of Texas, was the only person that knew. And, uh, and from there, I went on a quest of learning about organics. And uh, in fact, I had the first uh, distributorship for an organic fertilizer on the East Coast of the United States back in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, it's kind from of self-taught, you kind of. Oh yeah, no one, uh, this is all, um, no one was doing anything horticulturally with organics. Mm -hmm. So basically what we did is uh, we learned uh, all about it and then put it into a context that other, that landscape companies and arborists and uh, 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 greenhouse growers could mm -hmm. start using. So everything that we found, uh, somebody asked me one day, they said, well, who was your mentor? I said, there wasn't any mentors. I said, there were dead men in books. Mm -hmm. Sir Albert Howard, sure. um, George Washington Carver, uh, Rudolf Steiner, mm -hmm. you know, people that, that experimented and worked with organics and, but nobody really knew too much about them. Those were my mentors, just books. And um, so what I did back in the late 80s is I was educating people about organics because I was trying to market my organic fertilizer. And I realized nobody knew anything. They couldn't go anywhere to learn it. So and I it's hard to change um, people's thoughts and how they've been doing things for a long time. It's hard to. Oh, it's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Not impossible, just <laughs> difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it, was. it was. It's still difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we keep thinking that the light at the end of the tunnel is the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's always a train coming, you know. So this year is going <laughs> to make it. We're going to, everybody's going to turn organic this year. And we know it's going to happen because of the hundredth monkey theory that eventually there'll be a small group of people that get it. And from them getting it, it's going to spread um, quantitatively to everybody else. It's sure. called Morphic Resonance mm -hmm. by Rupert Sheldrake. So um, I was, uh, came back east and I started um, teaching people about organics, uh, going, going to golf courses in different places, and finally wrote an organic book um, back in 1989, uh, and it was uh, groundbreaking at the time. Is that book here? Well, that's the, the little green book is the okay. Um, that's the uh, final draft of that that just came out last year. Okay. So and you started writing it 20 well, I wrote years it ago. Back in 1989, and then it, it kind of went out because I was um, uh, using a Paul Sachs book in the classes. I, and, but I needed to update this, and last year I updated it, and uh, now Great. we're using it in the classes. And it's Great. A, 
I have to say it, it's a great book, <laughs> you know. And uh, I, I saw a psychic once in uh, Sedona, and he told me that I was going to write an organic book. And he said, you're going to call it The Little Green Book. I said, really? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. Tell he me said, more. Uh, you know, Mao Zedong took over the world with The Little Red Book. And I went, hmm. He says, you're going to do the same thing with this book. I said, oh, okay, you know. Forgot all about it. Wrote my book, called it The Probiotic Turf Tree and Plant Care Manual, you okay. know. Uh, and then I, when I was rewriting it last year, I woke up in the middle of the night and started walking to get some water, and I went, the little green book. I wrote it. <laughs> I got the name for it again, wow. you know, and nice. it's, it's now the little green book, and it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great book. So tell me about the class and what you guys are doing there at your well, school. Well, uh, we started the school back in 1993, and uh, it, we used to do it at night, and, and people would come to uh, it'd take a month to get your green gorilla. Um, diploma, because that's when you graduate from the school, you're a green gorilla, not gorilla, but gorilla. Gorilla. <laughs> I got that from the green gorillas of New York City. I met the original seven that started taking abandoned and destroyed lots in New York City and turning them into gardens, and they were called gorillas. Okay. <laughs> and I met them, and they just impressed me so much. I said, "Well, my graduates are going to be gorillas." Mm -hmm. Uh, and now uh, the green gorillas of New York City are now called the green gorillas, which is pretty cool, <laughs> you know. Uh, and we're kind of underneath the radar. And what we do is we take uh, students from all over the world, uh, which I find amazing because we don't do any advertising because we're a not-for-profit foundation. Right. And when you start that, uh, you really don't make any money. And uh, it's hard <laughs> to get the message out with <laughs> limited funds. Oh, yeah, with, with nothing. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> And uh, so the classes just develop from nighttime. We try different days, different places, different locations. We've done classes all over the country. We've done them in Houston, Phoenix, uh, Hilton Head. Kind of like seminars. You go and host a, or speak at different seminars. Well, what we do is we set up a two-day. It's a two-day program. Okay. okay. And uh, it, it's it, when we fly in. I fly in the instructors. If we do it in Vail or we do it in uh, Phoenix or Houston. I would fly in the instructors and we put the two day what we call an off off Broadway organic improv production <laughs> because I never know what anybody's going to say and uh, it's always new to me. And and you bring in all different uh, so to speak experts in their field yeah, to come in. Yeah, people who have graduated from the school uh, and are CEOs of their own companies go out and use organics and they, they want to come back and, and talk to the new students and say, oh look, I got this method that's great. great. When I first started doing chemicals, uh, everything was a secret. You know, you had a secret on how to kill the gypsy moth. You had a secret how to do this, and no one talked to each other. Hmm. With organics, it's completely different because it's all based on ethics. So um, you want to share your wisdom. You sure. want to share, look what I found. This is it, you know. Right. And you're not worried about uh, if a person's going to take it from you. You want to give it to them because we know we're all in this together. Right. And uh, it, it, we have to change things in a relatively quick time. You know, we've... We've spent uh, the last 150 years destroying this planet, and we have to change this rather rapidly. And uh, the Nature Lyceum is one of the only schools in the, in the world that's doing this. And like I said, you know, we are a part of nature, and it's a part of us. And if we destroy it, um, you know, I'm not quite sure what's going to become of us. <laughs> you know? Well, we're going to go the way of the dodo bird. Sure. You know, and it's happening right now. You know, you're talking of killing the gypsy moth, and um, we were talking before the show about, you know, poisoning the planet. And, you know, people, you know, want to get rid of certain pests in their yard or in their, you know, in their business, on their golf course or what have you. And, you know, people might not understand that if they spray for a certain pest, you know, they're also killing all the beneficial, such as the bees and the, you know, the ladybugs and the praying mantises, all these things that really serve a purpose. And, like, without the bees, we're not going to have food. They, they pollinate the That's crops. Right. And without them, you know, you can't target, you know, a certain little pest without killing everything else. And the same thing um, when people poison down to kill little voles and moles and all that. Well, they're coming in to eat usually the grubs. You know, so you don't have to put the poison down to kill the grubs, but um, people put poison down, and what happens is sometimes a hawk or another animal will eat these poisoned mm -hmm. voles, and, and they'll die. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's this whole effect that sometimes people, oh, oh, I'll just poison, you know, put this down to kill this, but there's really an effect that, you the know, unintended is compounded. consequences. Exactly, and it's yeah. really sad when, you know, you have a little hawk 